the cases we'll discuss are uh, pertaining to the management of the uh, complex pouch patient. There we go. So our first case is a 51-year-old gentleman uh, who was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis at 28 years old in 1992 and for years suffered with intermittent flares on sulfasalazine until 2006 when he had a severe flare in his symptoms and was admitted to the hospital and underwent colonoscopy and the pathology from which uh, demonstrated extensive high-grade dysplasia and probable fo foci of intramucosal, uh, intramucosal carcinoma. So in December of that year, he underwent the first of a, a two-step two uh, laparoscopic proctocolectomy with an ileal pouch, and the pathology confirmed three geographically separate uh, invasive colonic adenocarcinomas. So in 2007, he completes therapy with uh, Folfox uh, and has no evidence of recurrence. And for the years after this, is primarily managed by his oncologist. From 2011 through 2015, uh, he's complaining of diffuse, uh, profuse diarrhea for 20 bowel movements per day with incontinence that are primarily treated with antidiarrheals by his oncologist. This has associated weight loss, urgency, uh, cramping, but without blood. And he uses ibuprofen regularly for muscle and joint pains. In 2015, he's referred back to IBD at the University of Chicago. Uh, he has a stool test that's negative for C. difficile, and his labs show a microcytic anemia. He undergoes pouchoscopy in September of 2015, and this shows uh, these representative images show the diffuse gran granular and edematous mucosa with a few small erosions in the pouch. And then the uh, pre-pouch ileum has multiple small ulcers located circumferentially on the folds. And so these were felt to be more due to his chronic NSAID use. Um, rather than Crohn's disease. He gets treated with metronidazole and ciprofloxacin and a prednisone taper over the course of a month, and his bowel habits improve significantly down to four bowel movements per day without the use of antidiarrheals. They're formed without blood, urgency, or cramping. His weight improves and his anemia corrects. He has a follow-up pouchoscopy, uh, and the representative in images here show a uh, resolution of the granular and edematous uh, pouch and uh, resolution of the erosions. Dr. Sakuraba. Thanks, Anthony, for the great uh, case presentation. And oops, we don't have a slide here. Oh, hmm? oh it's there. Okay. <laughs> oops. Okay. And so the so first case we wanted to discuss first about the standard treatment for pouchitis. And diarrhea in a patient with a pouch, J pouch, is not normal and should be evaluated promptly. Unfortunately, for this case, uh, the patient was primarily followed by the oncologist for many years, and he suffered for uh, profuse diarrhea for many, many years. And the first step that we do when we see a, a patient uh, with pouch, uh, when a patient with a pouch presents with diarrhea, uh, we first do infectious evaluation, including C. difficile, endoscopic evaluation with a pouchoscopy, and also in the, currently we started to uh, evaluate the use of fecal calprotectin in pouchitis patients too. And first, I wanted to briefly uh, tell you about uh, C. difficile pouchitis. And the presentation of C. difficile pouchitis uh, may be higher stool frequency uh, than uh, regular uh, pouchitis. And symptoms, uh, a little bit of systemic symptoms, such as weight loss uh, associated with a C. difficile, uh, positive C. difficile PCR test. And risk factors include male gender, uh, pre-surgery uh, left-sided colitis, and previous hospitalizations for uh, pouch or uh, UC and also pre-surgery use of antibiotics uh, is a risk factor too. And also one of our surgery groups also recently found out that when the patient had uh, C. difficile prior to the surgery, that would put that patient at risk for developing C. difficile pouchitis uh, after the surgery and also for pouch failures. And for pouchitis, uh, there's a, a pouchitis uh, just like in the pre-pouch uh, just like uh, pre-surgery, we use, like say, HBI for Crohn's disease and uh, uh, like Lichtiger score for colitis. There's a clinical index that we use for pochitis. And here's the components of the modified pochitis disease activity index. And for clinical symptoms, there are stool frequencies that range from 0 to 2, rectal bleeding 0 or 1, a fecal urgency or abdominal cramps uh, score of 0 to 2, and fever, systemic uh, symptoms of fevers, temperature of above 37.8 is scored as 0 or 1. And for endoscopic evaluation, uh, edema, granularity, friability, loss of vascular pattern, mucus exudates, and ulcerations are all given a score of one, uh, just like for the Mayo endoscopy score that we use for uh, pre-surgery UC patients. 
And in general, if the patient has a total score, a total sum score of five, that's considered to be active pochitis. For the previous patients that we had, uh, he had a score of above 12. So was, uh, he was considered to have like severe pochitis. And for acute pochitis patients who present with a short uh, period of symptoms, uh, generally, once the uh, diagnosis is confirmed, uh, treatment with oral antibiotics such as Cipro or metronidazole is the first choice. And for mild cases and, or just a single flare, we give them usually for two weeks. And Cipro may be more effective than metronidazole in some retrospective studies. Also, uh, topical budesonide or even mesalamines can be effective when these uh, antibiotics are when the patients are refractory to these antibiotics or when they have residual symptoms. For chronic pouchitis, uh, uh, infirm patients uh, suffer from uh, symptoms for uh, many months or who require, uh, who experience multiple courses of pouchitis. Combinations of these two antibiotics, Cipro and metronidazole, or even with ref recently uh, rifaximin has been reported to be effective in these cases. In these cases, uh, sometimes you need maintenance treatment with Cipro or Flagyl, or sometimes even both. And uh, old studies from Europe, uh, from Italian studies, mentions that VSL number three, a probiotic uh, that's been also very effective to reduce the frequency of uh, flares in chronic pouchitis patients. And for uh, genuine pouchitis, I, um, I personally think that it's very rare that you require a, a systemic uh, steroid treatment or any treatment with uh, anti-TNF agents. And whenever you, consider, whenever you need to consider those kind of systemic treatments, you have to consider either the patient has like a uh, irritable pouch or the patient has a Crohn's disease of the pouch. And here, oops. Okay, and here's the fecal calprotectin that I mentioned in the previous slides. Uh, so fecal calpro, we have been using it more frequently to diagnose, uh, to evaluate activity in UC and in also in Crohn's disease. It's been also recently shown that it's very effective in evaluating the disease activity of pochitis. And in both slides, you can see that uh, the degree, the level of fecal calprotectin correlates with uh, the activity index of the pochitis uh, disease activity score and also with the endoscopic activity. So I think we should be using fecal calprotectin more often in pouch evaluation too. Yep. Mm -hmm. so case two is a 27-year-old gentleman with ulcerative colitis. He was diagnosed at 18 years old in 2007 and was initially steroid dependent despite mesalamine and then suffered a secondary loss of response to infliximab. He has acute worsening later in the year, uh, refractory to oral, then IV steroids, and eventually to IV cyclosporin. And so in late 2008, he starts a three-stage colectomy with ileal pouch, and the pathology confirms panel sort of colitis with the normal terminal ileum. From 2009 through 2013, unfortunately, he suffered from uh, recurrent uh, perirectal abscess and a fistula and ano. Uh, requiring multiple cetons to be placed and removed multiple times uh, and multiple courses of ciprofloxacin uh, occasionally with metronidazole. He undergoes pouchoscopy in late 2015 and he sh his pouchoscopy shows severe patchy inflammation of the pouch with broad-based shallow ulcers. He starts ciprofloxacin and at this time his symptoms are 4 to 8 bowel movements per day, uh, mostly liquid without blood and intermittent cramping. He has a repeat pouch repeat pouchoscopy on ciprofloxacin, and this uh, continues to show uh, scattered small and large ulcers, some at the suture line, but others located further away from the suture line. Um, and this is felt to be consistent with Crohn's disease of the pouch, and so in late 2016, he begins adalimumab, and so far has reported clinical response and follow-up. Okay, thanks again, uh, Anthony. And so the second case we're going to discuss about uh, when to consider Crohn's disease of the pouch. And it can occur in up to 3 to 13% of patients who have a J-pouch. And the risk factor associated with Crohn's of the pouch include a smoking history of smoking. And also multiple phenotypes uh, similar to the non-pouch Crohn's disease can happen. So this patient had uh, perianal uh, fistulas that were non-healing and also the patient had like multiple uh, broad-based ulcers which were not consistent with uh, regular pochitis and were more suggestive of Crohn's disease. And the disease can present in various ways, uh, inflammatory, 
uh, phenotype just as in Crohn's, just as in regular Crohn's disease. It shows discrete, small, and large ulcers, nodular RT, and X date. Only about 10% are shown to ha uh, have uh, granulomas on biopsy uh, compared to uh, patients with uh, regular or normal Crohn's disease who have uh, reportedly as high as 30% of granulomas. And foreign body granulomas, uh, when you biopsy uh, close to the suture line, you can occasionally see foreign body granulomas. So this should be uh, discriminated between, uh, differentiated between the regular granulomas. So the pathologist needs uh, high, the pathologist needs to be highly experienced. And also in some cases, stricturing uh, Crohn's can happen in the pouch. The locations can vary from the anastomic, uh, anastomotic site, uh, the pouch body, uh, pouch inlet, or the afferent limb, the pre-pouch ilium. And uh, in some cases, patients can be taken uh, NSAIDs, chronic NSAIDs injury. Chronic NSAIDs, so injury due to NSAIDs should be discriminated to uh, rule out uh, stricturing or inflammatory cases. And fistulizing Crohn's disease can happen also in the pouch. So differentials include, uh, first, first you have to differentiate, uh, rule out that the patient's uh, stricturing, the fistulization is not due to iatrogenic injury or the surgical procedure itself. Uh, sometimes after a pouch surgery, the ischemia can cause uh, fistulization along the suture lines. So this should be ruled out. And typically, the surgical complications happen shortly after the surgery, but when the patients develop uh, Crohn's disease of uh, fistulization of the pouch, uh, usually it develops uh, more than uh, 12 months or years after the surgery, uh, which would be indicated of Crohn's disease of the pouch. The openings of the fistula can be in the anal canal outside of the anastomosis or sometimes even at the top portion of the J-pouch, and it can be associated with surrounding inflammatory changes and also may form a complex uh, fistulization network just as in fistulas and uh, regular Crohn's disease. Okay, so in summary, consider pouchitis and C. difficile pouchitis when patients presents with uh, a change in bowel habits and systemic symptoms that are not uh, considered to be normal in a patient with J-pouch. And you can use calprotectin, uh, which correlates well with the pouch pouchitis activity, and treat, with, treat pouchitis with cipro, metronidazole, or in combination. And Crohn's disease of the pouch can present with inflammatory structurizing or fistulizing phenotypes just as in normal Crohn's disease. And be aware that there can be mimics of Crohn's disease which include chronic NSAIDs use or surgically related complications. Okay, that's it for us. Thank you.